Hello, welcome to jasonnewland.com. My name is Jason Newland. This is relaxation hypnosis for anxiety and panic attacks. Is that the whole set? I don't know. It's stress, anxiety and panic attacks. It's such a long title, I sometimes forget some of the words. Anyway, um, please only listen to this when you can safely close your eyes. And just to let you know that since the last recording, I've uploaded a, I think, I don't know, seven, maybe eight, maybe less recordings uh, from the past that I thought might be useful um, that were made specifically for either panic attacks or anxiety and stress. So and I've done hundreds of recordings for relaxation and that's on the relaxation hypnosis podcast and that's on Spreaker. Uh, it's available on various different podcast hosts as well. So I did want to upload all of those, just um, a couple that seemed really relevant to what I'm kind of trying to do here. So I hope that they were useful. I can't actually remember what I said on those recordings because... I didn't listen back to them. I don't really listen back to anything I do. But, you know, there, there might be, there might be some repetition. But then, repetition is, can be quite a good thing if it's useful stuff. You know, you don't want someone keep telling you, Oh, it's cloudy outside, it's cloudy outside, it's cloudy outside, because you don't need to keep being told that. But being told that you will get through this anxiety, you will get to a point where you no longer have the panic attacks. Hearing that repeated, whether in those words or in you know various different phrases and that is priceless and you know what it's what in my experience it's quite rare to actually hear somebody tell me that I'm going to be okay It's very rare that anyone actually says, you know, Jason, you're going to be okay. This is, you know, this is a, a short-term situation. This is, this anxiety will reduce. Um, this panic attack, it can't last forever. It will subside. And you will be okay in eventually even though they may be regular now they will become less regular hopefully with my help but also you know the old phrase the old it's very very old over over said phrase that time is a healer but it's true you know, in, in some ways it really is true that time, it, I think it's just another way of saying that sometimes healing takes time. Healing is not always instantaneous. You know, if you break your leg, nothing in the world is going to heal that broken bone other than just time for the healing process to take its time to do it so whether it's a few weeks or six weeks however long it is that it takes for you to be able to walk on that leg again without the plaster or without walking on 
I was going to say stilts, but that would be the opposite, wouldn't it? Walking with crutches or whatever. It might take six weeks, it might take longer, it might take less. So time itself isn't the healer. The healing is the healer. But healing needs time. And during that time, the best thing you can do, and any of us can do, is actually be nice to ourselves, you know? Give ourselves a break. I mean, my brother, years ago, this is a long, long time ago when I was at school, he, he was older than me and he, he fell off his moped and he broke his arm. He didn't fall off his, he crashed and he, and he broke his arm. And he had a cast on, you know, one of those proper, you know, the things that put your friends right on and stuff. I've never had one of those. I've broken a few bones, but they don't, I've never had casts, even when I broke my wrist about three, four years ago. They offered me either a full cast or one that I can just um, put on that had metal in it, which wrapped around the wrist, and I could take it off um, when I needed to, because it was in the summer, and uh, the specialist said it's been so hot, you're just going to get really itchy and uncomfortable. And he said, as long as you keep it on most of the time, um, that I could possibly take it off at night when I was in bed or you know, take it off if I was just resting it after you know the first few weeks but he didn't let it heal he was so determined that it was time for his arm to feel better because he was so active it was really he was one of these like super duper physical people that could always won races at school. It's always top of the of everything he did. He was really competitive and really super fit and strong and everything. And he didn't want this broken arm to hold him back. And at one point, probably two weeks into having the arm brace on, maybe less than that. He was trying to prove to my parents that he didn't need it on anymore and he was doing press ups. And it just reminds me, it just makes me think, well, not at the time, but at the time I thought, yeah, do more press ups, have more pain. But that was because, you know, I was a kid. I didn't mind him hurting himself. But, um,. It's that kind of being impatient, expecting something now. But it's different. So with a physical thing, a broken arm, it's painful, but you have painkillers and you have it in a, you know, provided it's nothing too serious. It's just, it's just a bit of pain and it, it subsides quite quickly after a few days and, you know, it's not a huge deal, hopefully. But when you've got anxiety and it's like a panic attack, full throttle, full in and going on, there is no impatience because that's not the way we're thinking. Because logic and reality doesn't come into it. Because during it, you can have a thousand people telling you, a thousand specialists, a thousand people that know everything about the brain and, you know, stress and anxiety, all saying to you, listen, Bob, if your name is Bob, you know, this will pass. This is just um, your adrenaline kicking in and you know, you're, it's, you you can't die from it, it's not gonna, it's just very uncomfortable, it's very horrible, to be fair, I don't think horrible even sums it up, I think it's, it's kind of terrifying actually, 
um, but those that have never had a panic or anxiety attack, they don't understand. Even though we all experience it differently. I've spoken to many people that have had uh, anxiety attacks. And you probably notice I use panic attack and anxiety attack. I use the same term meaning the same thing. It's, uh, I've spoken to many people and there's a lot of similarities. But then there's that level of, you know, some people manage to continue even when they're in the throes somehow. And I managed to do that a few times when at work. When what I perhaps should have done was, at the very least, had a break. Gone outside, explained what was going on to my manager, and just took a break or gone home. But then you got that problem of, uh, you look fine, physically, from the outside. It's the same with any kind of mental illness or disorder or, you know, health issue. F including things like pain as well, chronic pain. People look fine. The only, perhaps, indication that somebody is suffering is maybe the way that their face is, you know, the expression on their face, the way that someone's talking. Because somebody that's going through a panic or anxiety attack they will not be talking the same as they would do when they were feeling fine. There's a good chance that they would be perhaps sweating or they would be even physically moving differently. But I don't think this stuff is taught uh, to the general public. And I would say it's really important to be taught to teachers and taught to managers, you know, of companies, team leaders, you know, not just in education, but just generally, so that they can pick up on it. Because then you look after somebody, then you might have them, might have them working for you for a long time. Yeah, they might have to have three months off ill, have three months off work to recover, to, you know, get to a point where they feel able to return to work. But if you, you know, if that manager, that company has been kind and really caring to the person that's going through that anxiety, issues, the stress, the whatever you, you know, whatever's going on for them. you'll feel safe to go back to that place. And that, I think that makes a big difference. With my last job I had, I had, uh, I was having anxiety, stress, and was also diagnosed with bipolar. And I'd started to have being you know depression and stuff this is going back 2013 and I'd already been diagnosed with bipolar previous to that in 2011 so what I did is I told I would told my manager uh, I've been diagnosed I've got I've got depression I've been put on antidepressants but the antidepressants actually made me feel worse for uh, maybe a few weeks and then I started, it just, the anxiety really increased. So it's, it was kind of a very weird, I was kind of having quite high levels of activity in my brain. And it was all over the place. And it turned out that after I'd taken some time off work, everybody knew about it. Like it just spread through the the office for some reason. 
the I think he someone maybe the manager told told everyone and then he told told everyone in my team and then they could spread out to other people I no longer felt safe to go back to that job I tried to go back twice but I just didn't feel that people were treating me the way they used to because I was I was quite good at my job and I got on fairly well with pretty much everybody but they you know some people weren't talking to me some people were a bit too friendly you know like treating me all gentle when I'm not I'm not someone that needs to be treated um softly you know I kind of like to have a laugh and so I wasn't safe and I realise I might have gone off on a tangent here but I think some of these things are necessary to address to think about and realise that maybe you've been affected by the way that you've been treated which hasn't helped you hasn't you know been beneficial to your recovery to your and sometimes recovery isn't recovery it's managing but I know some medical or mental health experts first my situation with bipolar they class it it's recovery if you're not um, in a manic state or if you're not uh, clinically depressed if you're not in either of those states then you're in recovery see me I, the word recovery means that you've healed that you've recovered like with a broken leg you're walking around and it feels fine that's recovery but you know so the terminology is not I don't think it's useful because something like uh, bipolar or uh, schizophrenia or whatever um, or this this is the list is endless not just mental illnesses but physical illnesses there's many hundreds if not thousands that are lifelong like diabetes for example so it's about managing I don't believe that anxiety needs to be anything lifelong or stress or panic even but they can be connected to something else I know that a lot of people may have anxiety connected to another illness. I mean, it's, this is standard stuff in psychology with psychologists and psychiatrists that it's a lot of people that have extreme anxiety issues it's like another another thing added to their diagnosis but there's some people that are dealing with the anxiety they've been diagnosed with anxiety disorder which I was back in 2002 November and at that time that's, that's all I was diagnosed with and I don't want to say all I mean, they hadn't discovered any other stuff that I was... Well, they, they hadn't taken any notice of any of the other stuff. But it can be connected to bereavement. It can be connected to PTSD. I was diagnosed with that as well from the doctor. It's like, I got to the point, I go to doctors like, what's he going to give me this time? Honestly, you know, doctors and... Um, you know, these like professors, they have all these names and uh, letters after their name. I think we should be allowed to have that. Anyone that's had any kind of mental health issues. So, you know, like bipolar could be 
BPL and you know it's a Jason Newland BPL and it's a personality uh, with emotionally unstable personality disorder so that could be EUDP or whatever it is and then anxiety disorder so AD uh, you know we could just have all those letters after our names that make us look like professors the thing is I think it's worth remembering that actually having anxiety can be like a warning to you like your your body's warning you um, to maybe slow down I do believe that when I had the stress and the panic the first not major panic attack that I had not the real big one the, the first big one in November 2000 no yeah 2002 that was my body or my brain or whatever it's a way of telling me to stop what I'm doing to slow down because it happened during a pretend, like sales wise the best week of my life sales wise I broke the work, the sales record in the company and I spent all week doing it I worked long hours and I was more focused than probably I'd ever been in my life up to that point and I was drinking excessive amounts of coffee and I was drinking alcohol at night I probably wasn't getting enough sleep and it felt like something inside my head snapped something broke and I don't believe that could have happened just in one week it wasn't just one week of that it was it built up something I think I just didn't listen to my body I wasn't taking care of myself but at the same time I'm not going to blame myself either because I don't see any use in blame it's no use it's of no use all it does is fuel anger and hatred and when that's aimed at yourself what use is that the main thing I feel is kind of to learn from it and I think I did learn from it but I've still made similar mistakes since not anymore, but since that time I did, when I went and worked in another insurance company, it wasn't so much I did the long hours, but I definitely got a bit too emotionally involved and my stress levels rose to a point where it was too much. I suppose, I mean, you could say, what is the point of this conversation and what am I trying to get to? Well, firstly, don't blame yourself for anything when it comes to this stuff, when it comes to illness. You know, if you, if someone's diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, you wouldn't blame yourself, would you? Or if you had a a loved one, a child, partner, parents, best friend, so whoever, who was diagnosed with anxiety, or don't, you don't have to be diagnosed with anxiety to know you've got it. That's one of those things that you go to the doctor and I guess some people wouldn't know they've got it because they've never experienced it before and don't know what it is. But I think these days there's a lot more um, openness about it. It doesn't. I don't think anxiety has that uh, the taboo that something like maybe, let's say, bipolar would have. You know, it's it's 
if you look in the papers or in the news, it's, and it's very rarely that you'd see a negative story about someone that was um, having a panic attack or an anxiety attack or suffers stress. It's very much, I think, that people are quite caring about that because I would say a lot of people can relate to it even if it's just in a um, a kind of vague way because I would imagine everybody or pretty much everybody has had a moment in their life when they just lost a breath you know it's like and felt a bit weird and now about to do something big you know maybe walk down the aisle or walk their child down the aisle to get married or to speak in public for the first time or to go to an interview or to attend a funeral even you know and the first time I went this is back in 2004 for 2013 went to a funeral I didn't know it was going to be an open casket never never seen a, like a, a dead body before and I went into shock because I wasn't prepared for it if I'd been prepared for it I could have just kind of calmed myself down before going in or I might have just not gone in to be honest with you or I might have come in last and sat at the back so I never got to see the coffin but I didn't I went in first so I could get a, a seat because it was at a Buddhist centre and a lot of people were sitting down on the the mats but my hips don't allow me to sit down on the floor I have to sit on a chair so that's why I wasn't, wasn't that I wanted a, a good space at the funeral I just needed to find a chair so I went in and suddenly I was confronted with this uh, person that I knew. I wasn't prepared and I did go into panic mode and I had an anxiety attack. And I had to leave the building. But it didn't last long because what I found, I don't know about you, when it's connected to something obvious and when it seems logical, then I was, I, I was able to recover from it really quickly. So seeing a dead body, in my mind, that that's supposed to be shocking if you'd never seen one before. If I just walked in there, saw my friend dead, and it, I didn't blink an eyelid, then that would shock me, because I'd think, why? Surely, you know, I want to be affected by stuff like that. You know, it means I'm a human being. Maybe not to that level of a panic attack, but I've found over the years that when I have an anxiety attack and it's related to something, uh, like a funeral or my nan's funeral, I, I was, yeah, it was a really difficult anxiety-wise, but it's supposed to be, I guess. I didn't, I didn't care that I was going through huge anxiety during the funeral because it was my nan and I loved her dearly and I it it seemed I knew what was causing it but when it happened when I was in a bookshop like years ago just looking at a book now that scared me more because I didn't there was no trigger to it and I couldn't Therefore, because there was no trigger, how it was harder. It's, it felt like it was harder to calm down from. So maybe there's some times when, actually, if you have an anxiety attack, even if you've kind of feel like you've recovered from them and you don't have them hardly ever or perhaps never, and then occasionally you have one and it's. Instead of thinking, oh, here we're going again, it's all starting again. When's the next one going to happen? Instead of thinking like that, maybe look at the situation and think, 
Well, there's a reason for that. It's a trigger, you're triggered, which means that actually it doesn't mean that anything is returned, it just means that it was a one off. And actually, maybe loads of people that have never had a panic attack would also have had a very similar reaction. But it would just be called shock with them. It would just be called nerves for them. So if someone has a panic attack before going into a job interview, if they've never had anxiety or panic or been diagnosed or you know anything like that or have any understanding of it, they'd probably class it as nerves. They'd label it as nerves. And people would call it nerves once they explained it to other people and it'd just be accepted. And it would be a one-off situation and it'd be accepted like it was natural. And for some people, job interview can be a nervous situation. It doesn't have to be, but You know, these re- is, there's ways around that, but I think you get what I'm saying. It's someone that witnesses a car accident, they're in shock. And it's natural to have that. So I think that's what's the hardest part for a lot of people. It was for me with the panic attacks I used to have because they weren't connected to anything. The first one was, clearly, the first big one because I was hugely stressed. I was in the middle of a phone call with a customer and it was like I was outside of my own body and my brain, all I was thinking of is, don't, don't, you know, it's like something else was happening and scared the hell out of me but when it happened at the funerals it didn't scare me I wasn't scared I was uncomfortable very uncomfortable I wasn't scared I didn't I wasn't thinking, oh, what's caused this? Because it was obvious what had caused it, what had been the trigger, rather. So I think it's worth thinking that, you know, even though you will get to a point, or maybe you're already there, or getting to that point where you have less of those feelings, those feelings that you used to have or used to expect to have change. Because it's worth remembering as well that what we expect is more likely to happen. If we focus, what you look for is what you find more of. You know, it's the same as if you try this for an example, the next time you get in a car as a passenger, and you're going on a long journey, just say to yourself, wonder how many yellow cars I'm going to see. And you start to expect to see yellow cars, or maybe you'll see one and think, oh, that's one. And you might start off not expecting to see many, and then you'll see another one. And the more you see, the more you'll expect to see And the more you notice, then you'll notice cars that have yellow parts on them. Maybe one with a yellow bumper or a yellow top. Maybe one with yellow alloys, wheels or whatever. And you'll think, wow, I never realised there was this many yellow cars in the world. Never mind on the motorway. So it's kind of, it's not that 
there wouldn't have been any less yellow cars there if you'd have decided to focus on red cars. You just wouldn't have noticed the yellow cars. But you would have noticed a lot of red cars. So it's not that what we focus on like magically occurs necessarily it's just that that's what we see we focus we notice what we focus on and there was a time when I was constantly focusing on every single movement that my body made every time my body, my stomach grumbled I'd start thinking oh no this, uh, this, what's happening there even though before that I wouldn't care it's just as, as like now if my stomach's grumbling it's grumbling because I'm either I'm hungry or well usually it's because I'm hungry there's not yet any other reason normally or I need to go to the toilet perhaps so that's worth thinking about what you focus on what, no, it's not what you focus necessarily it's what you expect because you start to expect those yellow cars and more come along but even if you didn't expect them they'd still come along but you just perhaps wouldn't have noticed because you weren't thinking about it I like the idea of having like a tap connected to your brain so that when the stress level gets too much it just like an overflow you know an overflow that you have uh, the drips usually it sticks out of the wall of the building you're in if there's an overflow it just drips out so there's no floods and it can't get it can't go over the top just like with baths they've got a gap haven't they so near just below the taps so that if the water gets too high the water flows out the same in a in a sink there's a hole you know underneath the taps so if it gets above a certain level it overflows it flows out i like the idea of having that built in to our minds that's the hypnosis part there bing it's now in your head and kind of just overflows so you don't have to think about it it's like a safety valve maybe another thing and I'll leave you on this one is it's okay to occasionally feel a bit stressed even if or just it's okay anyway because you're a human being but that idea that if you get something fixed then it's never ever going to happen again is not always the most useful way to think it's useful to not expect it to happen again because there's, there's less chance it's going to happen again if you don't expect it But I'll give you an example. I had my I, used to, I was partly deaf in one of my ears when I was a kid, and I had an operation. And whenever I, after the operation, someone perhaps when I was at home, my dad would say something, and I'd say what, or probably pardon. I think I probably was a bit more polite back then. Uh, and my dad, he'd <laughs> be going, he'd say. That's it. We're going taking him back to the back to the doctors. The operation clearly didn't work. Now my hearing is fairly okay. I don't always catch what people are saying, so perhaps my hearing isn't you know, perfect all the time. And maybe I've got half the hearing in one ear. Maybe I don't know. I haven't had my ears tested since I was like seven or eight. Yeah, about eight years old. But it doesn't mean that I'm now deaf. 
not that I was deaf, but I was a lot less. I had very bad hearing in one ear. It doesn't mean that something's recurring. It just means that, you know, if someone has physical pain and they have, it's like if you have a broken leg, let's go back to the broken leg analogy. You can still have a pain in your leg without thinking, oh no, it's broken again. It might just be cramp. It might just be the way you slept. You might have bashed it and forgotten about it. Now, I'm, I'm proper clumsy to the times. I told you I fell out of the bath. I broke my wrist. Um, I've bashed my legs. I've bashed my shoulders, my arms. But I don't think anything of it when it's happened. And then the next day, I, you know, I wake up and I've got a big bruise. And I'm thinking, where did that come from? And I don't, I just, I have to kind of try and think back. Because there's been times when I've gone into a panic mode. When actually it's just a bruise. Sometimes a bruise is just a bruise. Sometimes a pain in the stomach is just a pain in the stomach. In fact, most times that's all it is. Just indigestion or just a bit of gas. It's just like saying, you know, most of the time a headache is just a headache. I want to say just, it's a horrible thing to have. It's very uncomfortable, it can be painful. Well, all headaches are painful, aren't they? But it's, it's a headache. It doesn't mean it's a, a brain hemorrhage or brain tumour. It's a headache. And it's okay to have headaches. It's okay to have a stomachache. It's okay to feel stressful sometimes. It's okay for that stress to arise. But then you've got that overflow built into your mind and it can reduce. And you can feel it reduce. And that's a good thing about it because that feeling of your anxiety and stress reducing now actually feels pleasurable. So you can get more in tune with that. You can focus more on that feeling. So you start to expect it. And as we've already talked about with the yellow cars, when you expect something, you start to notice it more. I remember when I was uh, learning to meditate and... I used to, the thing is, I used to say, and I said to one of the teachers, I said, I keep drifting off. Like I'm counting the breaths or I'm uh, focusing on something that they're talking about. And I, I, I drift off. And the teacher said, well, what happens when you drift off? I said, well, I'll start counting again. And they said, well, that's good then, isn't it? I said, no, but I'm drifting off. And the teacher said, yeah, but you noticed that you were drifting off. Oh. You mean I'm doing good? I said, yeah, that's really good. Because you're aware. Your awareness has increased. You're aware that your mind was wondering. Wondering what? No, wondering, as in wondering, not wondering. Oh, okay. And... That's one of the good things of being able to be aware. So if you're aware of your stress levels, that's a good thing because that's when you can focus and notice those stress levels reducing, that anxiety reducing, which is a wonderful a wonderful thing to happen because it means your awareness has increased. It actually means that you're doing really well. Instead of um, beating yourself up thinking, oh, I'm still getting this anxiety, I'm still getting stressed. and Instead of thinking that way, because having a go at yourself and being cruel to yourself is never useful. 
it is a form of self-harm and it's please don't do it that's all I could say on that one treat yourself the way that you would treat a small child that you absolutely adore or an elderly relative that you love to bits maybe it's a grandparent maybe it's a parent maybe it's your own child maybe it's your niece your nephew maybe it's it's in my case it's a ferret my little Andre I love him with all my heart and there's things that I probably would do to myself that I would never do to him there's the way I talk to myself I would never say that to him and he can't even understand what I'm saying so imagine saying that to someone that can understand what you're saying and saying the things that you perhaps say to yourself those things that are nasty and like putting yourself down and I'm not going to list a few lots of different things that you may say to yourself but you don't need me to but you'll start to notice it and when you notice it you can start thinking would you say that to your grandparent would you say that to your grandchild or your son or your daughter or someone else that you absolutely love to bits would you say that to your husband or your wife or if you haven't got anyone that you can think of you know sort of in your life maybe that you can think of as an example of someone you wouldn't say it to or would you go into a hospital ward into a hospital ward full of really really sick people or go into a um, I don't know what the name of the place is but go into somewhere where someone's really sick end of life maybe and would you say those things to someone in a bed that's lying there extremely ill I can guarantee the word the answer to that is no you deserve that same respect you deserve that same kindness that same loving and I realise this can be an emotional thing to hear because maybe it's been a while since anyone's told you that you deserve that kindness and you deserve to be kind to yourself but that is a fact it's a simple but powerful and as far as I'm concerned it is a fact and nothing that anyone could ever say would change my mind on that be kind whatever that means it doesn't mean you have to necessarily do anything other than just think some nice things maybe think about some stuff that you've done in the past that has been lovely you know sometimes you've helped somebody or it can be maybe something like I like to imagine winning the lottery even though I don't even do the lottery but I like to sometimes just imagine all the things that I do to help other people it feels lovely and I've not even done it I don't even know if I would if I'm honest if I won 10 million or a million I don't know if I'd give give most of it away but thinking about giving most of it away feels lovely in reality I might just disappear and go and buy an island somewhere but it doesn't matter because this is imagination in my imagination I've got blonde hair and I'm six foot nine doesn't mean it's real but it feels nice
I just maybe imagine something that hasn't happened that's nice. Imagine tomorrow feeling completely relaxed. Whatever you're doing, wherever you are, whoever you're with. Imagine getting to a point where everything is a trigger for you to feel calm and awake and aware but calm. So when you see a yellow car go past and that might stick in your head because I've mentioned it quite a bit you feel maybe a sense of relaxation that tomorrow and let me know this because this is this is a little experiment I want to do with you and please leave a comment on this uh, podcast come back to the podcast and leave a po- comment if, if you don't mind tomorrow let me know if you see somebody if you go out of the house whether it's to work or visiting a friend or shopping let me know if you see anyone with a, uh, a broken leg you know, leg in plaster or on crutches crutches, crutches because you'll notice it and when you see that person with a broken leg you'll actually feel relaxed within yourself and you get a sense of perhaps relief that your legs are okay maybe as well as that feeling of compassion because compassion doesn't always have to go out to other people you can't have it towards yourself as well you know how about sharing that love sharing it with yourself So I'm going to leave you on that. And remember you've got that overflow now. We kind of like connected that to your mind. So that's there. And. So the stress levels. Can only go so far. And then they overflow. So you don't have to really be too concerned about that anymore. But. Just you know. Think about tomorrow. Think about the things that you're going to be doing. You might have it planned, you might not, but maybe you can plan it. Maybe it can be a fantasy. You might not be going out tomorrow, but maybe imagine a fantasy tomorrow. Something that just feels really nice, really relaxing. Because sometimes all you need to do to feel wonderful is just close your eyes. So that's the end of this recording. It's gone on a lot longer than I expected. I thought it was going to be about half an hour, but it's nearly an hour. So thank you for listening. And as you probably noticed, I can talk forever. So this could have lasted for another two hours probably, but I'm going to try and... I try not to talk for more than an hour. I think that's enough for anybody uh, to, to put up with. So thank you very much for listening. And just remember to get in touch with those nice thoughts within you that you have towards yourself. And I will be back back very soon with another recording. And until that time, whether it's tomorrow or the day after, Just remember that you deserve to be happy. Remember to be kind to yourself. 
lots of love. Bye.